So we have a scripture reading this morning from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. We will read verses 17 through 20 from the NIV translation. So if you stand with me, please, we will read together. Since it's a short passage, we'll just all read together at the same time. And I'm going to turn this way so I can read as well. She, Jack. As the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, the number of our people in Egypt had greatly increased. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. He dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. At that time, Moses was born, and he was no ordinary child, For three months, he was cared for by his family. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's welcome our brother, dear brother, Pastor Sung Ho. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to encourage you to uh, to follow, uh, as usual, the the, the handout uh, for today's uh, message um, to to kind of... um, uh, show you where I am going uh, with the message uh, this morning. And as uh, Professor Craig Smith uh, read for us, Acts chapter 7, uh, verses 17 to 20, the title of the message today is The Dualistic View of God and History and Its Problems, may I add, and Its Problems. So today's sermon is a um, continuation uh, of the message I preached uh, last time. If you recall, um, I mentioned some major topics uh, bypassingly, such as the sovereignty of God and human free will and how we are to understand uh, the relationship and the tension between the two. Uh, and secondly, I mentioned also allegory and the literal interpretations of the scripture. And I hope to cover these in more detail uh, as we progress uh, throughout the coming semester. And I also mentioned... Um, the dualistic view of history and God, and so on. So today I want to focus more deeply upon this uh, topic, the dualistic view of God and history and some of its problems. Now, this all-powerful secular tendency to neatly separate God from history and thereby from the public sphere of life. And unfortunately, in the secular world that we live in, the overwhelming popular tendency is to reject God altogether from the public life and treat faith as a personal and private matter. And in many parts of the world, if not all, to my understanding, this is simply taken for granted. No one really dares to stand up and raise objections against such uh, over overwhelming tendency, but we we, we need to ask before we go on to uh, critique uh, uh, this worldview of separating God from the public life and history and so on, how how and why has it come to that position? I I think we need to understand um, the background and the context in which such worldview arose. And we need to be honest and we need to always bear in mind the all-important principle of integrity as we ask these critical questions, right? So what is the reason? What is the reason which secular minds often give for separating God from history, for such dualistic worldview? Now, in all fairness, such tendency came about due to our fault. (laughs) Um, Religious fighting, wars, Uh, continuing bloodshed uh, in certain parts of the world uh, caused by religious fighting. And in many ways, I think that we Christians are accountable for such criticism. Uh, For instance, anti-Semitism, which which means hatred against Jews. Uh, In Korea, this is not really uh, obviously prevalent and it's not really under... The seriousness of this is not really understood here. But when I was in Europe... Uh, of course, um, throughout the, the history and the, and the Great World Wars, anti-Semitism was a huge thing. 
uh, which has some devastating historical consequences. Hatred against Jews, which were, by the way, justified by Christians, right? Um, and this has been the most serious tendency, especially in Europe, with devastating and tragic historical consequences. And, of course, the list goes on, fighting amongst uh, different um, factions of Christianity, different denominations of Christianity, and the bloodshed uh, thereof, and the never-ending bloodshed between the Muslims and the Jews and so on. And all that is not a very good example for our children. Right? All that does beg the question, what is the purpose of religion? If it leads to, inevitably, at some point, to such bloodshed and fighting, then perhaps the world is a better place without it. And you can see where that kind of criticism comes from. And you can somehow sympathize with such uh, critical spirit to a certain extent. And, you know, we cannot deny such shameful historical reality and fact that there were too many so-called religious leaders, I think, who get kind of confused between their true calling, their true role, as well as being some kind of a political leaders, uh, and, and they have used religion for power, right? They have used religion and they have used God for their selfish gains and power, and thereby, and, and they also um, have so cleverly uh, justified their cause with sacred language, and after a while, people see through that, and they ask these critical questions. Maybe we can do without God. Maybe we can do without religion in this world. If it's going to lead to such, you know, if it's going to lead to such problems, uh, fighting, violence, intolerance, and so on, right? So you can understand where such criticism may arise from. Um, but I challenge that the people who have used religion for their selfish gains, people who have waged war in the name of God for selfish gains and power, are going to face the final judgment of Christ, and He will judge with righteousness. And there's, no, and there's going to be no hiding and escape from the judgment of Christ. Right? All, all of us, at the end, will have to stand before the judgment of Christ, and there is not going to be escape or running away or hiding okay, from this. For God judges in righteousness with impartiality. So all in all, the tendency to neatly separate God from history or from the public life is a powerful one, isn't it? It's a powerful tendency that which all of us here at Handong will have to face at a certain point once or upon leaving this place. How do we combine our faith with our work? How do we combine our faith with, with the job that I'm working in? And that begs much thought. And I, I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to cover the whole thing comprehensively this morning, but it, hopefully it will spark further thinking and discussions in your life. Because it certainly has been a burden on my heart, something I've been working with for so many years now um, regarding this uh, question. The secular world will say, oh, you must leave your faith in the private. You must leave your faith at home, in your personal life. Never bring your faith to the public. Never. And I'm sure you will agree that this is a powerful, powerful um, tendency. And quite honestly, in my life, in my personal life, I have simply succumbed to this for many years. Um, I never felt comfortable talking about my faith in the public sphere. You know, I was actually invited to um, give a presentation at um, a national university nearby. And, uh, oh, I mean, the kind of tension and the look on people's face when I mentioned about Jesus and the biblical principles and so on and tried to combine that to, to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, some of the, uh, the, the secular topics. People just looked, right? And that look on, on, on their faces just really drove me down and really weighed upon me. I never sweated so much in my whole life, giving that presentation. Uh, it was that difficult. And it, it's, it, perhaps you need to have a, a, a special gift in presenting Christian faith, you know, in a non-believing context. I don't know. Um, 
And I never felt comfortable talking about Christian faith in the public, uh, perhaps because I was so aware of uh, what these preconcep preconceptions are about churches and ministers and Christians and so on. Um, I, I, I've always felt uncomfortable, especially with preconceptions that secular people have about Christian ministers, preachers. Um, and believe me, I know <laughs> the preconceptions that some, of people, some, some people have towards uh, churches and especially preachers and how their wives should behave, you know, uh, and how their children should behave or even look like and so on, which is why I kind of shied away from um, ordination even after completing my, um, my studies at seminaries, you know. Um, so, again, that was an all-powerful tendency uh, to separate God from the public life. And I've done that, and I was rather like that for many years of my life, you know, growing up in the West. Uh, but thankfully, in response to this powerful secular tendency of separating God from the public life, Stephen has something to say, uh, as we have read this morning. Now, we come to the story of Moses uh, in Stephen's long um, speech before the Sanhedrin. And in many ways, Moses stands out as the greatest of all Old Testament leaders. Um, perhaps the most representative, as we see in the transfiguration narrative in the Gospels, is Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets uh, and so on. Now, John chapter 1, verse 17 says this, For the law was given through Moses, Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So he's certainly a representative figure. And Moses was a leader who had, who had led the people of Israel from Egypt to Canaan. And uh, he was the lawgiver and God's representative. And towards the end of his life, Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. So Moses is pointing to a greater redeemer, perhaps the Messiah, it seems, uh, who is from Israel and that God's people must listen to him. And it kind of echoes the transfiguration narrative in the Gospels when the Lord Jesus stands with Moses and Elijah and God out of the, the cloud commands the disciples that they must listen to his son Jesus. And, and that uh, paragraph in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, kind of uh, is a foreshadow of later events realized uh, through our Lord Christ Jesus. So we were told uh, that the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, had to go to Egypt because there was a famine in their land. And God saves them through Joseph, the son of Jacob, who foresaw famine and had made provision for it. But the years had passed and another king, another pharaoh rose to power, to whom, it says, Joseph meant nothing. And he dealt treacherously with our people, it says, and oppressed our ancestors by forcing them to throw out their newborn babies so that they would die. Now, let me begin by saying that Pharaoh, in this context, represents the epitome of the secular mindset today, which is also true of today. And the essential trouble with all who are sinners, who reject the gospel and are opposed to God. What was the trouble with this king? What was the trouble with this pharaoh? Now, the ultimate trouble with pharaoh and the world today in depravity, in sin, likewise, is that men and women are not aware of God's purpose and His works in history, in the concrete reality of our history. Again, the dualistic worldview that neatly separates God from history is evident also in Pharaoh's mindset. And the exact same tendency, of course, is prevalent today. Prevalent. And I think perhaps another terminology to, to describe such dualistic tendency is the humanistic worldview, uh, which has so profoundly 
uh, impacted the world and blinded the world at large that many simply misread history. Many simply shut their eyes to the essential core of the problems of our world and thereby fail to learn from it, which is why the history, in a negative sense, always repeats itself. It's a vicious circle. But why? Because we never learn from it. We never get to the core problem uh, of our historical reality. And thus, the problem never really gets solved, never gets penetrated, right? It just gets largely ignored and neglected, which is why the problem is still there. And the same principle, maybe with different outlooks, with different people, different era, repeats itself continuously because we do not get to the core of the problem. And the reason for that is such dualistic worldview of separating God from history and thereby from the public life. And I think another terminology that describes such dualistic worldview is a humanistic worldview, which has profoundly impacted me as a person, as an individual, as well as the general public out there. The trouble with humanity is, therefore, that it tends to regard history just as series of events. This happened when and that happened when on certain dates and so on. You know, my experience, unfortunately, as a child uh, in a history class was just memorizing dates, which I can no longer remember. Um, and, and, you know, when someone was born, when someone died, and history in... I think continues to be, I think, taught like that in cer certain places. Um, and you have to wonder, is that what historical, historical study uh, is all about? You know, what dates did certain wars broke out and so on? That's what I spent time learning. Maybe some of you share the same experience with me. You see, but what's worse today is that many are interested only in their immediate sectors of history, that only in their immediate sectors, only in their immediate times. And um, such tendency may be tied with individualism. By individualism, by the way, which continues to have a profound impact upon the Western mindset in particular. Uh, and this kind of um, becomes more evident um, through different ideologies such as liberalism, neoliberalism, and so on, in which this sovereignty of the individual becomes particularly pronounced. Uh, and it, again, it has a great and profound impact upon our thinking, upon our life, upon our government is structured and so on. Uh, again, uh, I, I, I hope to address this uh, individualism uh, biblically uh, this coming semester because it's a, it's a huge topic, isn't it? Um, and it seems clear that Pharaoh had this tendency. Pharaoh had this tendency. He dismissed Joseph and the history which Joseph represented. The history in which God acted for the salvation of his people as well as for the Gentile nation Egypt. Right? And Joseph's salvation, sorry, Joseph's history of salvation meant nothing to him, he says. Of course, Pharaoh must have heard of Joseph, he must have known him. But it didn't care for it. it. It didn't care for the essence of the story concerning Joseph. And the essence, of course, was the history of God's salvation through his servant. And it seems that all he cared about was his little view and immediate view of history of his own day and age. Just like the popular secular tendency today, Pharaoh neatly separated God from history. He didn't care for it. But there was another failure of Pharaoh, um, which is also true today, and that is he not only ignored what God had done in the past history, he did not look forward to the future either. You see, if you are ignorant about the past, there is no way you can prepare for the future. Right? We are all too concerned about immediate events, immediate needs, immediate pleasures, and very few are interested in the future with the eternal perspective as prophesied by the scripture. Again, having a sound doctrine of eschatology, the end times, is of paramount importance. And we must give it a full consideration in accordance with the scripture. So what a short-sighted view 
of life this Pharaoh had. Right? And what a short-sighted view of life this Pharaoh had. But then again, it is also true of many people today. You see, we are not that different after all, are we? Uh, we think that because it's ancient and we are living in the modern, that we are miles apart, but we, we are not really. The essence of human nature in depravity, in sin, has not changed. Has not changed. The modern world uh, commits the most serious fallacy by neatly detaching God from history and thereby ignoring what God had done in the past as well as what he will do in the future. And this ignorance, as I said, is directly responsible for most misinterpretations and misjudgments with respect to life. When you take out the one thing that truly matters, which is God and his works of salvation from life, you have nothing left. Right? You have nothing left. You have completely missed the point. You have completely missed the essence of the story. And that was the, the, the serious fallacy of the Pharaoh. And I think he represents the secular mindset even today, this dualistic worldview. The ancient Egyptian king was only thinking of himself and only in terms of his plans. He will, he will, and this is how he thought. Here were people living among Egyptians, these Israelites. They were foreigners who didn't belong. So they had to leave. Moreover, their numbers were increasing, and Pharaoh felt that they were a threat to his kingdom, so he, he decided to get rid of them. He was not aware of who, of, who, you know, of who these people were. He didn't want to understand anything about them. For him, Joseph and its history meant nothing. So Pharaoh's thinking was solely in terms of himself, his ability, his power, his nation, his kingdom, nothing else. And in a way, he had what we call today a very humanistic worldview of life. People only think in terms of human activity, human ability, and this is celebrated. This is praise above all else. Human possibilities, and, and yet people leave out the biggest factor of life, the Creator God, without whom nothing really makes sense and nothing really stands. But history simply, you know, history simply cannot be understood at all apart from God and His intervention. The most important consideration is that God has a plan and a purpose for this world. And deciphering what this purpose is, right, it is a matter of life and death. You know, these days people are so proud of... Um, scientific achievements, people are so fervently passionate as we approach um, election season, so fervently passionate about their political ideologies and their leaders, and they almost praise these leaders into the realm of the divine, you know? Um, listen, I'm not here to denounce these things. Of course, we must have a functioning and democratic government and law and order and we all clearly benefit from scientific and technological advancements. But the way in which we celebrate them, but the way in which we glorify them, I think is worrying. And I think it's bordering idolatry in many ways. The way we get excited and put our faith in them. Not only science and politics, but philosophies too, in a way. Again, it has its rightful place. But the problem is when we do not see that God is greater than our thinking, that God is greater than our systems, therein creeps the dangers of idolatrous thinking. And men and women are glorified. And history is, is considered in terms of human activities and achievements and not a single mention of God. But what is even worse is that men and women not only fail to see God's plan in history, but behind such dualistic worldview, there is this willful resistance and rebellion against God, real intentional rebellion against God. And this Pharaoh is intentional in his rebellion against God. He sets out to exterminate God's people. I mean, look at the New Testament. When God sent his only son into the world, what happened? 
people nailed our Lord to the cross. A willful resistance and rebellion against God. Again, we are responsible and accountable for our own actions. Why? Because God has created us as free agents, right? With a, a, a free will. We are accountable for our actions. And when God did the greatest thing in the history of humanity, what did the people do? Right? People nailed them to the cross. That was the reaction of the world when God reached out graciously to save us. Right? That was what people did in response to God's act of salvation. And the Christian church, ever since the very beginning, has likewise always endured persecution. Always. I can't remember a, a particular time when church thrived right, in the history of the church. Always endured uh, persecution to the point of death. Today, the church is being ignored, to put it mildly. Um, but she's enduring sarcasm, scorn. Oh, boy. And the church continues to experience severe persecutions, even to the point of death, in certain parts of the world. But why? But why does the world behave like this? Why do men and women resist and rebel against God? And the answer is that sin has blinded our mind. This power of the original sin, the fall of man, has blinded our mind and has brought about ignorance as a result of, of who God is. Now, I think we need to be very careful with the, uh, the expressions and terminologies of the Bible because when we use the words like ignorance or freedom or love uh, or power, um, we, we, we bring in our secular baggage and thereby sometimes we distort what the Scripture means by these terms. Right? So we need to sometimes differentiate the, 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 the distinction between the biblical expression of these words as well as how the secular world uses these words. And ignorance here does not mean uh, a lack of education or lack of intellectual capacity or, or, or absence thereof, right? The ignorance here is not referring to intellectual capacity or knowledge. Rather, it is referring to the spiritual knowledge of who God is. And by the way, let me remind you, Jesus said through his parables that that if you are, unless you are like this little child, that you cannot enter the kingdom of God, meaning that the knowledge of God is available and accessible by the least of us, you know, for the least of us. You don't have to be this um, uh, giant intellectual um, uh, being in ivory tower to truly grasp who God is. It's not referring to that intellectual capacity. You can be the most intelligent person in the world of academia, and yet still be ignorant of God, right? The tragedy with this Pharaoh was his ignorance, his ignorance of the fact that God was with Joseph. In the same manner, the world today does not see the God who has made it all, the everlasting creator, the God who is above all, infinite in wisdom and knowledge and power. Psalm 14 verse 1 says this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. It's clear that the expression fool here does not refer to the people who lack intelligence or academic capacity. No, it is pointing to people who call themselves kings of this world. Those who pride in their power and wealth and try to play God. These are the fools according to scripture. The scripture calls these people fools, ignorant of God. Just like this king of Egypt, who was ignorant of the fact that if it wasn't for Joseph's interpretation of dreams, if it wasn't for his provision that he had made, Egypt would have also faced the terrible famine as well, right? But he didn't want to hear about it. He didn't want to hear about it. He dismissed, he dismissed this tremendous act of God's servant Joseph, which had saved Egypt from the famine. Even though Egypt had experienced God's salvation through Joseph, this Pharaoh simply dismissed it. Simply dismissed it. So God is a, a savior of not just Israel, but it seems of the Gentiles as well. Right? 
But the act of、uh, Pharaoh couldn't be more ungrateful, right? Couldn't be more ignorant. After having witnessed and experienced this amazing salvation in his history, he chose to ignore the fact of history and its reality. Sheer ignorance, right? And、that's the kind of ignorance that the Bible is talking about, which cannot go unpunished, right? He chose to ignore the facts of his own history, sheer ignorance. I mean, look back across history, read the biblical history. The world in sin would rather choose to ignore what God has done. Above all, the world does not know that though the world has sinned against God and deserves nothing but God's punishment, nevertheless. As John chapter three verse sixteen says, God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want you to ask yourself this morning these crucial questions: Can politicians save us? Of course not. Can philosophers? No. Who can? We often forget that question, don't we? There is only one hope in the world today, and there will always be one hope in the world in the time to come, and it is in this Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, Amen, by whom God has made redemption possible for us. Christ Jesus Himself is the Lord of history, but the world just keeps on ignoring all of these facts. And get too busy and excited, praising ourselves and our own intellect, our own humanity and our own achievements and our own little systems. The fact that God sent His only Son into this world—he was born in poverty, he lived a life of self-renunciation and of suffering, and that he gave himself freely on the cross on Calvary to bear the punishment of our sins, so that we may be forgiven and restored to God and reconciled with Him and have. Everlasting life. The world just conveniently ignores all of this. The fact that our Lord Jesus conquered death and He rose in a glorious resurrection and ascended to the right hand of God in heaven. The world just conveniently forgets all this. Not only is this the world in depravity, ignorant of God, there is also, as I say, ingratitude. I mean, look at this king of Egypt. He would not have been on the throne. Right, if he had not been for Joseph, his nation, his kingdom would not even have survived the famine if it wasn't for Joseph, and God's provision and His act of salvation. But he forgets all that, right? And there is not a hint of gratefulness. Egypt would have been destroyed by the famine, no doubt. It was the ability and wisdom that God gave to Joseph that saved the whole country of Egypt. And the world is still the same, isn't it? It's still the same today. The world just conveniently forgets what God has done through our Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation, for our eternal life. The world says, "Ah, I'm not interested in that." They dismiss it. They even ignore the facts of history. Do you see how deceptive such dualistic worldview is? Do you see how how dangerous and destructive such human、uh, humanistic worldview is? And I sincerely hope that I was, as I was preparing this message, I couldn't help but look back at myself. I sincerely, prayerfully hope that I myself do not degenerate into someone who conveniently forgets the favor of God in my life and the gift of life that He has bestowed upon me, as well as the favors I have been shown and given by people around me. If I do, you may slap me, <laughs> because ingratitude. Is betrayal, right? Ingratitude, in so many words, is betrayal. I mean, just look at the politics of our nations. The more I watch the news, the more I realize, wow. I mean, just begs much thought as to how Christians,、uh, what Christians should be doing, really does. Just look at the politics of our nations. I mean, there is no gratitude in politics, and I, I seriously don't understand why some Christians would get so excited about their political leaders in the church, and they somehow combine 
uh, the political ideologies with, I mean, one has to be extremely cautious when one does that, right? Extremely cautious. I mean, look at the politics. Every man is out for himself, right? That's all it matters. One day they, they, they take pictures, holding hands, shaking hands, and the next day they're out to kill each other. I'm not, I, I, I don't get excited about that. Even though, for instance, God had sent his only son to save us, what does the world do? It laughs at it. It despises God. They spit into the face of God who comes to, to, to save us despite our sin. But finally, and this is, I think, the all-important principle that we must bear in mind, is that whether the world recognizes God in history or not, um, and, I think, and I think it's interesting to see that the Scripture and our God through His Word simply proclaims the truth, right? In a kind of... Um, uh, A clear manner but it doesn't beg people right it doesn't seek to persuade people who have just been committed uh, against God it doesn't do that because one thing that we can learn from the biblical history is that whether people believe in him or not one thing is absolutely certain and that is God's timing is moving nearer and nearer and nothing can stop it no matter what right so whether you, you agree with him or not God's timing is coming, and his timing is absolute and is certain. And as we see in the passage this morning, as the time drew near for God to fulfill his promise to Abraham, right? history is moving steadily in the direction of God's predestined goal. And there is nothing that can stop that. And the Bible tells us that God's purpose is that of deliverance. And blessing for his people, as we see in Acts chapter 7, verses 6 to 7, right? God spoke to him in this way. For 400 years, your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated. Do you see how, you know, God's timing is moving forward, right? But I will punish the nation, he says. They serve as slaves. And afterward... They will come out of that country and worship me in this place. When God's time came, God fulfills his promise to the people of Israel. But there is more, right? In the New Testament times, the times of the church that we are in today, the new exodus, the greater salvation brought to us by our Lord Jesus sets us free from the bondage of sin and death so that we may have new life. Eternal life, new nature, new strength, new hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when God's timing comes, it's perfect, it's absolute. But there's an, also another side. When the time of God comes, there is also going to be a judgment upon God's enemies, whose mind is intentionally and willfully opposed against him. And there is no evasion from this, I'm afraid. Acts chapter 7, verse 7 says this, But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. See, our justice system fails sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, we need to have a justice system in place, but unfortunately, it fails sometimes. And evil people often get away with sin, but not in God's judgment. And that's why God's judgment is an essential part of the good news of the gospel. Because it promises to be righteous, it promises to be impartial, right? And there is no evasion, there is no evil people getting away with their sins in God's judgment, which, which, is, which is delegated to the Son at the end of days. What happened to Pharaoh, right? The great king from one of the greatest dynasties of the ancient world. What happened to him? And he was going to do things in his way. He played God. But he was completely defeated. Right? And this is only a foreshadow of the greater things to come. Right? When Christ returns at the end of days. And we must take, therefore, this grand view of history. And we must look back as well as look forward. 
and see it all under the eye of God. And this is the eternal perspective, having that widened horizon of our perspectives, of the way we look at the world, the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at our God. So the choice comes down to this. You either belong to the people of God or else you belong to the people of Pharaoh and all that he represents. The world that is opposed to God, the world that self-glories, the world that is so ignorant and separates God from the world. And the history of the Bible shows us that to defy God and to detach him from our life, from our public life or from our, 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 our history always leads to destruction, whether individual or corporate. See, when you choose to ignore God like that, it's not, too, it's not too difficult to see where that will lead to. It's not too difficult to imagine the consequences of detaching God from the public. It's not too difficult. It's not rocket science, I always say, to imagine the results of detaching God from history. You see, Moses also had to make this choice. He could have stayed in Egypt and lived in comfort, luxury, or leave all that behind and belong to the people of God. And he didn't hesitate. Hebrew chapter 11 verse 25 says, he chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeing pleasures of sin. In the same manner, we are confronted with the same choice in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 to 14. Enter through the narrow gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. May God save us from this humanistic worldview. May God save us from this dualistic worldview that separates the one thing that truly matters in life. God and his purpose, and his works of salvation. Let us pray. I'd like to ask the EPT to come forth, please. And let's uh, spend a few moments in prayer, and let us pray for the courage and boldness to stand for God's ways in this ever-changing world. And it's certainly not easy, but let us be firm in our faith and in our trust in God. Let's make this our prayer this morning. Let us pray that we will not conform to the worldly ways of life, but live a life of righteousness in accordance with the Word of God. So let us strive um, to get the Word of God right in our understanding, so that we may live it and practice it in our life. So let us ask for God's wisdom uh, for the semester ahead. Let us also ask for God's wisdom upon our leaders in this place as well as in our nations that God's will be done despite our weakness, despite our inability to fully comprehend God's sovereignty and His purpose. Let us ask for God's wisdom and His mercy upon us at the same time. Let us pray.
let us also uh, renew our commitment uh, by giving thanksgiving and praise to God for the fact that we have been called as God's people, belonging not to this worldly kingdom, but to God's kingdom. So let us give our thanks and praise for that amazing gift of salvation. So let us also ask that our eternal perspective will continue to grow as we study the Word by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. stand for our final hymn this morning. So what can I say? So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart of God Completely to you Sing so often. So I'll stand with arms high and unabandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am. Here's your sin against our sin. So I'll stand with arms high and unabandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am. Here's your I'm so I'll stand. So I'll stand with arms high and unabandoned in all of the one who gave it all. I'll stand the soul or to surrender. I am is your. Heavenly Father, we ask for courage and boldness to stand for your ways in this ever-changing world. And help us, O Lord, to be firm in our faith and in our trust in you, O Lord. And help us not to conform and be overwhelmed and intimidated by the worldly ways of life, but help us to live a life of righteousness in accordance with your word. And help us with your wisdom to uh, understand your word aright so that we may live it, O oh Lord, together as a community of your people. And we thank you, O oh Lord, and we praise you for the fact that you have called us into your kingdom as your children, O oh Lord. So we ask that our eternal perspective will continue to deepen and grow through your word by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face 
shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.